and start recording. All right. All right, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Nicholas Hemstreet. I'm a Nova Film student, uh, joined by my guest host here. Hello, I'm uh, EJ Chicky. I'm also a Nova Film student. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the um, overlooked or unsung heroes of uh, film productions um, on this episode. So um, I guess the first question is, what are kind of the first roles or departments that come to mind when you think about like on set or in a production? When I think about underappreciated roles on a film side, I usually think about grips and gaffers because I think people don't realize that without them, the director, the cinematographer, they wouldn't be able to do their job if at all or as effectively as they could with, with them. Mm -hmm. um, and like with the grip or the key grip, you know, they're the one who are, who are operating the cameras. They're preparing the camera, putting it on the rig, making sure it's ready to sh shoot for the cinematographer. Um, and so, and they're the one adding the filters and lights. And then the gaffer is the one actually setting up the lights. And he's the one who actually executes the cinematographer's um, lighting design that he got from the director. So basically what happens is the cinematographer will get the directions from the director. This is what I want this scene to look like lighting wise. Cinematographer will then go to his gaffer who will tell him this is how, you know, this is what I want here and here. And then he'll get the lights and make it happen. And then they'll usually have um, best boys who are their key assistant who will also basically, um, it's kind of like a pyramid that will go down and say, this is what we need. Um, and then both of them, the grips and gaffers kind of work together cohesively to get the overall finished product. So while the gaffers get the actual specific lights, the grips will make those rigs to put the lights in. And so it's kind of the symbiotic relationship that they have. So one or not the other couldn't do their job. And then without them, both the higher you know, position, like the directors were talking, couldn't do their job at all. Mm -hmm. uh, I found something interesting There's some history behind the gaffer. The gaffer was actually the, the, is a British slang term for an old man. Oh, really? But, and the way they had the uh, film got the name was apparently in British theater, it was used to describe the man who adjusted the lighting that came from the city lamplighters and they used a gaff pole that had a hook on it, which would light the gas lamps in the streets. Oh, very interesting. Wow. So I, they took that and I, um, for, so that's how Gaffer came along. Um, so I found that was interesting that there was some history behind the name there. But yeah, that's what when people talk about, you know, underappreciated, but I think those two, because I watched, all, there was a whole video I watched, I think it was in film production two. And it was, what would a scene look like without, um, you know, a gaffer and a grip? And it was, it did not look great in summary. <laughs> um, and I didn't realize how much they play a role in making the scene look as good as it does in the, in, on, you know, in the theater. Um, so I, I think they're my main, like, go-to for underappreciated roles. Yeah, definitely. I think, yeah, because last semester, I guess that was spring 2022, uh, I, I was in production, film production two, and I worked, we worked on, like, three films during the semester and my professor for that class professor wad would put me as either a gaffer or grip and i'd never worked solely as a gaffer or grip before and i was like wow this is i mean it's cool it was really fun because i i'm so used to doing stuff like kind of being a, a jack of all trades for either like final film projects for the semester or stuff that i've done by myself you know i'm the writer director cinematographer lighter you know i'm doing everything and it's it, it doesn't meet a good yeah. standard because I, you know i can only do so much but when you have an entire class of like i don't know i guess like 15 16 people in my class and everyone's doing something different and you're res solely responsible for setting up the lights or setting up the camera and like you realize how important that is because everybody is busy doing something else and setting up the set or, or getting actors ready or, or going over the shot list and stuff like that. And it's pretty hectic. And um, so it's definitely like really important and something I didn't realize was like 
so vital to an ease, like like a like a a seamless production until I was standing in those shoes. Yeah, I always I always thought that the cinematographer handled not only overseeing the camera and making sure he's getting the right sh the shot he they want, but also I thought they also actually physically did the lighting setup too. And to an extent, yes, but also mainly it's the grips and gaffers. Mm. And they just kind of he just tells them, you know, this is what I want. This is how it needs to look for the director. And then they actually are the ones that go out. So um and once I learned more about them, I was like, wow, you know, without them, you know, it wouldn't it wouldn't be as um professional level looking with and so you just you think about that and you're like, so why are they, you know, farther up in the credits if you know, or but I you could say that with a lot of roles. And so I think that's the whole point that I think everyone gravitates towards the you know director producer cinematographer and the actors but there's so many more roles that get that film done besides those you know four top main um jobs so i, I think it's very interesting and i think um needs to be more shed light on those roles as well um i mean no discredit from other ones but i think you know when because i always when i watch a film i always watch through the credits Mm -hmm. because to see who worked on it and i mean for the grips and gaffers there's a long list of everyone who did everything and so mm -hmm. but it's usually like two-thirds of the way down of the the credit line that you get to those so right yeah they're they're definitely i mean and and i this this is like our experiences with it like something that we've underappreciated or or have not realized the significance of that role and when I was researching this, I stumbled across um, Dolby's YouTube, um, and they have a fantastic series. It's like Sound and Image Lab, where they do like deep dives with filmmakers and the directors, or you know, like the sound designers and the, and the colorist. And two episodes specifically, I watched one for Matt Reeves' The Batman that just came out. Uh, it was Matt Reeves and then the colorist that we're talking about the style, the visual style. And then for Dune, Denis Villeneuve's Dune with his sound team. And they talked about the process of designing and, and creating the sounds of the film. And both were like, were, were, were incredibly insightful. And maybe that's just because, I don't know how you are, when, but when I watch like professionals talk about the creative process of, of making movies, it like really inspires me and it like really, it really makes oh, yeah. me appreciate the work that they put into it. Yeah, I love I love listening to how they did this or how they went about going and then other people besides the director and how like I was really fascinated by um I'm a huge Star Wars fanatic. And so for the original trilogy, I list I um I read something about the sound designer Ben Burt and how mm -hmm. he came up with all the sounds that we know today, like the lightsaber, Chewbacca's roar and all that. And it's like fascinating how he's able to just take these modern you know sounds by themselves and put them together like the tie fighter roar is a synth uh symphonic um elephant roar it's a synthesized elephant roar and i thought you know never you would think to put those two together but so I, yeah sound design to me is very interesting because they have to be creative in their own way of taking you know sounds in our real world and trying to make them either otherworldly or futuristic or you know whatever the setting is and trying to think of you know what would go well with what and same with foley artists too i mean mm -hmm. most of the sounds you hear in a film aren't recorded in camera they're done post and so like walking sounds and all are all foley and so they have to come up you know creatively of how do i gonna they take like two objects you would think would never make you know that sound and they, and they do it and so i think it's fascinating and yeah it's definitely um interesting to hear them speak and then you know applying what they say and then applying it to your own you know work later down the road yeah like i guess like as a sound designer you have to like uh essentially like create like these characters out of these 
otherworldly or sometimes like an inhuman uh, characters or animals or beasts or or machines or stuff like that like um like they were talking about the sound design of the sandworm in dune um and how the motivation behind the the p- pumping the thumping pulsing yeah. sound it creates was was so it creates like vibrations in the sand so it kind of liquefies the sand so it can swim through it and i thought that was really cool and how that carried over and the device they used in the film to call the sandworms it does the same thing and and even like the ornithopters like the dragonfly helicopter things so cool i i i loved any villeneuve so much and his his scale in sci-fi films and and how grounded he he makes his films feel while still being like some incredible otherworldly sci-fi masterpieces essentially and and the sound design that went into the ornithopters was was something that's very insect like yet like like this militaristic machine that functions in a way that like very similarly to helicopters but does not is yeah. not at all a helicopter it's just really really cool um so i i i, I love that aspect of of um of sound design and it's really interesting because I've had professors tell me before that sound is really important. You can get away, you can get away with a lot with like the visual style of a film, right? Because yeah, we have like Blair Witch, which is a found footage film. And it, it essentially, I mean, by all means, it, it like looks bad compared to other pieces of cinema where, you know, it has a very different look and, but audiences will still buy it because it's, it's, it's it's, it's yeah they, um, they expect that it's supposed to be like this docu film yeah they expect that it's supposed to be like recorded in camera and shaky and because yeah. they're actually there um but yeah i know yeah the, i think the saying is audiences will forgive visuals but they will not forgive sound yeah and that is like so true because in like all of my films that i've worked on i've definitely neglected sound because i just I don't know a lot about sound design and like because it's it's so interesting how I've like been trained to focus on like pre-production and even put and and even production you know sections of of a project but post-production has always been like just editing and and adding in some sound effects and stuff like that but that's some of the most important work you have to put in in post-production yeah it's really it's it's not as easy as people think it is and it's very tricky Mm -hmm. and like I have for my final film for film production too, I actually got an actual shotgun like that I attached to my DLSR and it made a huge difference in sound quality than say when I did uh, my film production one final film, which was just straightly shot on uh, iPhone. And it was all the sound was recorded in there. And um, now most of it was, I had music going over for most of the film, but some of the stuff like in uh, recorded sound, it sounded kind of, tinny and not very you know wasn't great but yeah i think people will have this concept oh i gotta make sure the visuals look good and you know so people will but if your sound is jarring they're going to be focusing on the jarring sound and not what's going on story-wise and so i Mm -hmm. think you have to put a lot of time into sound um for it to be convincing on both levels um that's another symbiotic relationship visuals and sound have to go together mesh well you can't have one higher than the other. It has to be, you know, pretty on the same. Now you can focus more slightly on visual style than sound or sound over. There are films that focus on, but the proportions are pretty close. They're not in proportionate. Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, I've noticed that in a lot of student films, including mine, not having sound and then watching it on presentation day. And you're like, wow, this is, you know, I can't, you can't get over how bad it sounds, even yeah. though it might be pretty decent. Because it might sound good in your headphones when you're at home editing, and then you put it on speakers and it's like, whoa, what is that? Like, that's not what I thought it would be. And it's it's really incredible, like how, because because sound is, is, is very technical and like designing sound to, to sound good in like any system, like any any setup people have, like in cinemas, at home, 
like on on mobile devices even it's it's like you have to make it sound good it's obviously i believe the best experience and what they tailor the experience for is the cinematic experience with you know you have those speakers set up uh, in, uh, in a professional manner but yeah sound will it will kill your film if it's not done well and it's yeah. it's ruined a lot of my films having the yeah, right audio level like when i'm editing i'm like okay what audio level and like you're supposed to have it at like under negative 12 and below is like the good mark but mm -hmm. sometimes you know you think it needs to be more punchier but then it, when you we you know replay it back you're like okay that's way too loud and then so trying to tune all that also is very you know yeah so it sounds very like you said technical and there's a lot more facets that go into it than um you would think um yeah so yeah you don't have great sound you know it doesn't matter what kind of visuals you have the, the audience will they're going to be sucked out of the immersion and more dang why does this sound like you know you shot on iphone exactly yeah um i guess moving away from sound now is like another uh department that i like I, i've totally overlooked before as well it's also in post-production is is color grading and, and colorists um like i said the episode i watched with uh, dolby sound and image lab was with the director matt reeves and the colorist of the film and and talking about the color palette and the tone of the film is is really interesting and something i don't going into this i had like knew nothing about i was like i know a little color psychology like red is passion blue is is sadness you know green is envy stuff like that but it is when you when you trace it back to film an incredibly technical process that requires a lot of like understanding of of yeah. chemicals and, and what looks good and and, and a lot of experimentation with the film and the color itself um and and just like listening to colorist talk about color grading has been incredibly eye-opening for me you know i don't know what your experience is with color grading at all but I've, I've never really graded any of my films i've just like left it as is yeah so i didn't i graded my final film for film production too that was my first kind of um deep dive into that mm. before i like you said i just kind of submitted it as it is i didn't even touch it i might have maybe touched a little bit of saturation here or there and to make something you know if i had to like do a reshoot and the lighting was slightly off the that next day before from the original then i would maybe tinker it to where it looks pretty uh synchronous with the other um shots but i haven't like changed you know color palettes for that and then until my final film for film production two and i started getting into it and yeah it's it's just as technical as sound in its own way because you're because color has emotion linked to it and if you're trying to get a certain feel you want the audience to feel a certain way in this certain scene then you have to tailor the colors and all and you know it's it can be kind of daunting at first because you're like okay you know you put too much here and then it starts looking you know sepia-ish and then if you turn it up and then it's too you know, so you have to find that balance um so yeah it's i've had some experience but i definitely don't i need more you know i don't call myself a color grader but i have dabbled in it and yeah it's very technical and you need to know what you're doing because you can't just go into it and think oh i want this film to look a certain way but it might not match what's going on or maybe that that you look you had in your head you're like oh yeah and then you try to put it on there and it's like it looks completely terrible and you're like oh well, man, i need to rethink how i want to do this but you also don't want to leave it as is because i think people have this preaching oh if i get like a red camera or something it's going to look good right off the gate but that's not how that does no mm -hmm. it, you have to shoot in a certain like raw or something and so that's why when people are surprised oh why does it look so you know sat, uh, desaturated it was because it's shot in raw and then you have to bring the colors out yeah has more color information for you to bring each piece of um visual information in your scene out so but if you shoot in regular like i think it's rec 709 you don't have as much uh leeway to work with 
it looks pretty good out of camera, but like if you start going too over, it's going to start degrading the image. Mm -hmm. and so that's, I think that's another thing. You have, to, you have to figure out the balance of making sure you're not going over. So it's degrading the quality, but also not going too little because then it's just going to look, you know, flat and it's not going to be three dimensional like you want it to be. And then the audience is not going to be as immersed or um, as attentive as they would be if it was, you know, fully um, colored. Yeah. Um, for my film directing class, um, we were using the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema 4K cameras. And I had that was the first time I'd used that camera. And I was, I was looking at it in editing because we we're doing like a camera test project where we did different focal lengths and stuff like that. And it was extremely, the color was extremely washed out. I was like, why does it look like this? It was because, you know, pocket cinemas are, are meant to, th those cameras, they have, they're shot in raw and they have the color information in the data of the file, but like you have to go in the color grade to bring that up, alter it, change it yourself, um, which is really cool. And also funny that, you know, Blackmagic just sends you DaVinci Resolve with the, with the camera as, as in addition to it, which is nice because like they know, you know, um, but I, I guess I have the, the definition of a colorist, which is like, um, you know, it's, it's the individual who works directly with the director and the director of photography to create a particular look and tone integrated in the color grading of the film that illustrates a specific palette. Um, so I, I found this this colorist named Taylor Jones. He's central in Kansas City. Um, and he broke down the duties of a colorist kind of in six parts. Uh, the first part is color correction, which is where you adjust the contrast and exposure uh, that are in the shot, which is what we were kind of talking about. You know, what, what you said you experienced was dabbling with the, the exposure. Um, and um, I just got a pop up that said, so we'll end in 10 minutes the meeting so we might have to I do another you, one i think you can change it towards um unlimited but i don't know how to do that because my i did another podcast um earlier today and he had to do he had to change it to unlimited but okay I'll, I'll look at that once this once this runs out and maybe we can come back to it i'll edit this out anyways um part two is adjusting the key elements uh which is he described the skin tones. So um, his example was that he graded the frame, but the skin tones were, were rosy. So sometimes you'll have elements of the picture that are off and some that are correct. And you just have to go in and adjust those elements of it. Um, the third uh, step was the color grading. Uh, and this is like the stylized, this is where you stylize the shot where you add the tone to it make the shot warmer or cooler with like oranges and, and blues of tones in the frame. Um, and this is one that I hadn't thought of before, which is matching shots, uh, which is where you ensure the color, you know, carries continuity throughout your sequence of shots so that like you have one location, right? And you have a shot of a sunset and then a shot of two characters sitting in that sunset. You have to make sure the same color is, is the same in both shots while they're different shots they might be shot at different times different times a day you know whatever you know you have to make sure that they look the same because in the film that's seconds apart um the fifth step is adding depth um and this is where you kind of put your your artistic take onto it you know you add um the colors and, and a grade that reflects emotion in the scene or in the frame um, like if a character's feeling isolated or scared, you know, you might make it darker uh, and bring out some more blues or something like that. Um, and then the sixth step is quality control. And um, this is the technical aspect, which is how your film's color must fit within certain parameters in order for it to show correctly uh, when it's being broadcast or, or shown in cinemas and stuff like that, which I thought was interesting because I didn't even realize, I didn't even think to, that you had to like, fit your your range in you know a format or, or, or parameters so that yeah you can show up correctly because i think of when you like say buy a blu-ray or something that says you know before the movie starts this is this or on tv and they show a movie you know this movie isn't formatted to fit this screen that's why because 
TVs don't have as much pixel depth and color um, information as say the movie theaters. So they have to scale it down so it looks the same as it would on a movie theater. Yeah. Um, so a little bit about the history of color grading, you know, um, color grading can be dated back to, I guess, early, early cinema when people were stenciling and coloring onto the film itself or tinting the film um, a certain hue to reflect a certain time of day or something like that, like blue uh, for nighttime uh, or orange for morning or, or daytime and stuff like that. Um, there was this machine that was invented called a Hazeltine uh, that made grading films a little bit easier. Uh, it was this machine that was made up of like three rods with um, kind of two colors per rod. The first rod had red and cyan. Another rod had green and magenta. And another rod had blue and yellow. Um, and so how you would work it is you would go in and the hazel team would affect the whole image. And you had to adjust each color level individually to affect the image. Um, it was described as a little limiting of the time. Uh, because again, you're restricted to those those colors, and you have to adjust that manually. Um, but then in 2000, um, uh, the digital, the first digitally color graded film, "Oh Brother, Where Art Thou?" by the Coen Brothers, with uh, Roger Deakins as a cinematographer, they were the first motion picture to color grade a film digitally with using software and stuff, and that was really groundbreaking for colorists or color graders. Um, because they shot it in, I think, Minnesota during the summer where all the grass and all the trees are, are really lush and green and, and they wanted it, the film to have a dusty and like rustic dry feel to it. So they went in and, and changed all the color to all the green to like a yellowish brownish, you know, something that a little, a little dustier. Um, and that was really groundbreaking at the time. And now, you know, color grading, digital color grading has been made more accessible. You know, people can get software on their own devices and 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 learn this stuff on YouTube, which is what we're kind of doing right now, right? We're, we're I mean, I learned a lot from YouTube videos. Like yeah. Half of my education is YouTube, you know, just watching stuff um, and other people talk about it um, and learning the software. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I love film or uh color in film you know i think color psychology is really really cool and it is something that i haven't had the luxury to kind of include in my personal projects but you look at these i guess not a list but professionally produced films and motion pictures and there's a whole department dedicated to doing this and um yeah, it's really, really cool. And something I, I'd never really thought to kind of dip my toes in. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, it, is, it is a really, really interesting uh, piece of the post-production process on a film. You know, it, it partners really well with just editing and, and again, sound design in the film as well, which I found really compelling, uh, but yeah. You know, if you look at like, I saw, I think, a comparison video of like Mad Max Fury Road pre colored and then post colored and it was quite stark. And that film, you know, that's films, that's a good example of, you know, what color can do for a film. And I mean, look at Wes Anderson's films. If they didn't have, you know, color, I think, because he uses color so prominently in his films, almost to, almost as a way to drive the narrative forward. Mm -hmm. If you didn't have that, I mean, he obviously used color sets, but they obviously colored to make it more prominent. So if, if without that color, his, his films would be more, you know, be flatter. And so it wouldn't come across. But yeah, like you said, with color psychology, it just adds another layer to that depth of the film. And it helps people, you know, relate to what the character is feeling or what they're supposed to be feeling at overall, the scene, the mood. Um, and so having a colorist who can do their job very effectively helps out um immensely just like same with sound and there's and the sound designer yeah 
I think, yeah, because Wes Anderson is one of those filmmakers that you'd think of, you know, part of what makes an an Artur is his visual color palette, right? And it's really like his pastels and his his style, his visual style is very unique and something you think of right off the bat when you think of his films, um, something super saturated and, 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 and colorful and vibrant. Um, but you also have films like Sin City that are like black and white, but will highlight a single color in, in the image. And that is, is really cool as well. Or like the girl, little girl in Schindler's List with the red coat. Yeah. Yeah, that was the only part in that film that had uh, color in it just to impact that, you know, this little girl is eventually going to go get killed. And so, and they're killing children. Yeah. So red coat really signifies to the audience, oh, you know, no one's safe, you know, under Nazi occupation, especially the Jews. So, yeah, color really plays a part. Even if you have a lack of color and you put a little bit, that it tells so much, even, you know, with the absence of color. Mm-hmm. so um and even coloring with it with like sin city with making like shadows you know more predominant or not that also tells the story in itself too if you even if you have a black and white film so mm-hmm. it's not their job is very you know important because if you're doing a black and white film you still have to convey an emotion with the lighting and exposure exposure and shadows and um making it pop even though there's no you know color per se yeah and i was saying that you know even with a film with just black and white and lack of color per se Mm -hmm. it's still important for the colors to you invoke a certain mood or uh tone um with light you know the exposure and shadows and enhancing that just with a um, beyond the point of just the camera uh, what's in camera and so and then when you do put pops of colors here and there then it just even adds even more you know um, visual storytelling and emotion to it because predominantly the film has a lack of color mm-hmm. so um, either way it's very important to get that across um, no matter what type of look you're going for yeah i think the same could be said about like sound and films like films with like i guess little dialogue but still have you know a a, a lot of foldy or or ambiance going on are as the same can be said because the more you can make you know a non or i guess like a like a like i guess the sound design feel like a character you know, the more successful, or not successful, but the more compelling it can be. Like, yeah. um, I think of like Quiet Place, right? With John Krasinski yeah. uh, directed that film, you know, it is, it's all motivated because the monsters in the film, you know, are, are hyper sensitive and hyper aware to sound. And, you know, it's it's motivated to a point where you can't have your character speaking. And, um color can be expressed as a character as well you know um when we were talking about sin city and schindler's list right the red jacket or or um i don't know there's there's multiple things in sin city i think but it becomes a character almost you know you give it those yeah. qualities and, and make it feel you know alive and um yeah so i think there are plenty plenty of other uh, uh departments or jobs in a, a production that we have not discussed but you know oh, yeah. the ones we have are 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 you know still like i still don't understand everything about color grading which is like it's it's so technical and i just don't i don't know i have a hard time learning about it just from reading it you know it's i'm very much a hands-on learner so i would have to like do it myself yeah, you have to really, that's what, for me, you can read as much about it, but until you do it and get a, a, a good grip on it, you won't fully understand just by, you know, reading or watching videos. You get a good sense, but you have to, I think film is one of those mediums that you have to do to fully understand. Um, and film theory is great and all because you need that as well, but I think the majority of it needs to be actual 
onset experience for you to fully understand the stuff you learn in film theory for us all come full circle. Yeah, for sure. I think it's definitely been hard uh, having the majority of my education be online for film studies. Um, but, you know, this past semester, again, like I said, I, I've worked, I, I think even this past year, the past two semesters, I've worked more on like like sets than I have previously. And maybe that's just the classes I'm taking at this point, you know, or, or what have you. But it is, is it's a very active and hands-on thing. Yeah. And that, that's what draws me so much to it. Um, but, you know, if you're watching this and you're thinking, what are some other uh, jobs on set that I, I, you know, I don't even know? Watch those credits, look up, Google what those jobs are, learn about it, read about it, discover yeah. on your own, you know, ask yeah. people. I mean, there's the, you know, focus puller. I mean, that one is extremely important. And that one's not really talked about a lot either. But yeah, I read, we had to do, we had to read about focus pulling in film production too. And there's a whole math and you know science to it in its own way. You have to have a ruler and you have to, you know, measure what's in focus and all that. And if anything moves out of focus then you got to redo every, and it's extremely precise. And so having the ability to be that precise while say the camera's moving and, you know, there's, I know there's like, now they're creating different like technology where you can stand outside of the, where the camera operator is and focus pull. Cause you have a screen there to see the, that you can see what the camera's uh, seeing, but you know, for that's just now coming in. So most of them are physically, you know, on the focus pole with the camera right, right to their side, and they have to move with the camera operator while making sure they hit their mark. Yeah, they go over or under. Well, then they have to redo everything, everything. So that I think that's another one that's underappreciated, but extremely integral to, you know. Um, filmmaking and especially if there's a director who loves to do, you know, rack focuses and uses that you got to have a great focus puller to do you know execute all that or you know it's not going to be um as impactful because it was a bad you know uh pull of focus yeah just talking about the camera alone it's like there yeah. is never only one person on camera on a set no. you can have it on a crane with a camera operator on the crane on the camera on the crane and someone's pulling the crane or a dolly, you know, someone's pulling a dolly. And like you said, someone pulling focus. If you mess up, that's the shot. So you have to do it over. You have to, everyone's got to reset. You know, it might not sound exciting or flashy, but it, like everything else, it is very, very important. Yeah, Same thing right. with, with grips, you know. Yeah, everything's intentional in film. So you, the focus pull has an intent, you know, intended purpose. And so you have to get it just right. So yeah, there's not just one person filming there's at least three or four if not more around the person on the camera to be doing different things either pushing the dolly focus pulling operating the crane um making sure you know the cameraman doesn't trip over anything or is hitting his his marks too and getting the full uh picture so yeah there's a lot of many jobs that are integral into getting that final look yeah the one that just came to mind was, was boom operator. You know, I've, I've, yeah. I've never worked as a boom operator, but my classmates have, and they're like, yeah, I got to switch off. Let me, let me take a break. You know, like yeah. it's, it's physically taxing. And my, my directing uh, project, I was a director, but we had a, we had a boom operator and one had to hold it. One had to, um, you know, press play and stop. Mm -hmm. And we had to find different positions where they're out of frame, but they can get, they have it just enough so we can hear the actor and you have, there's this whole, and then making sure they got it. And there wasn't any um, unintentional noises that weren't supposed to be in there. And then, yeah, yeah, it's, and then you're holding it there for, you know, how long this, the take is. And so, yeah, it's another one that's, and sometimes usually boom operators have a, the recorder and then the boom operator but sometimes they have to do it both so yeah they like control pack and they have to and then they have to be making sure wait there's a plane over stop and then once the plane goes over okay you're good or wait a train's coming or something to make sure everything's you know silent for the take and they have to make and then they have to process press and record and process all that while simultaneously holding a 
you know, boom mic, which yeah. can be, you know, how many many feet long? Like, so, yeah, ten feet long, right? With a, it, yeah. you know, it's heavy, you know. But luckily, I haven't had to do that yet. I'm sure I will, but <laughs> I'm, um, I'll see how I feel about it once I do it. But yeah, I mean, there are, I mean, applying this to my my personal life, you know, I'm I'm someone who's going straight into the industry and I'm, I'm looking for work and you know some of these jobs that are not as flashy or as popular as director screenwriter dop you know slater is really important too someone yeah. who controls a slate you is know that, that saves the editor from a huge headache. yeah it's 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 vital for the, ed- the post-production process as well you know and keeping on track of of how what you've done so far and because we were you're at. Had a editing class, we had to edit, and there was one with the slate, and you that slate was a lifesaver because you have this huge amounts of film uh, footage, and you have to sync it up with the audio, and it's not an easy feat. You have to see right where the the peak is, and that's where you sync it. If yeah. you don't have a slate and you forget to, it's it's a you know pain. And sometimes yeah. I, on personal products of mine, and I know other people, they forget the slate, and then. You know, later on in the editing, they're like, um, it's really hard to try to sync this. Yeah. You don't have, you don't have that uh, audio cue to know when. Um, but yeah, saying, going back to what you're saying, going to industry, you know, even being a PA on a set will get your foot in the door. And then you yeah. work up from there. You get to know the people on that set and you can network while overseeing everything that's being done. And even if you're okay, you, even if you aren't the director or a DP or, you know, um being a you know grip or gaffer or someone that's helping those you know lowly jobs so to speak that aren't really but you know what someone would perceive Mm -hmm. that all gives you experience and that gives you reputation and then you can work up from there i mean there's a lot of dps there's a lot of you know gaffers and grips that become dps later because they work so closely with the dp right there's a lot of dps that become directors later on yeah so it all works up from there and unless you i mean you can't think of it as i'm gonna get pigeonholed in this job for the rest of my no i mean if you love that job a lot then yeah you can stay a gripper gaffer i know i watched some videos where they love being a grip and gaffer and they stayed that Mm -hmm. then i've also watched videos where they worked so long as a grip and gaffer that they finally you know a director said hey i would like to be your cinematographer and they do that or because they're so effective at their job. So it's all about just moving up, but you got to get your foot in the door. You can't just go out and think, oh, I'm going to be a director on a big film. You have to start somewhere. And even yeah. if that means make, getting coffee runs. I mean, it all is just, it builds up though. And you, you need to have that on. If you're on the set and ex- get that experience, then you can go from there, but you got to get there before you can start getting those bigger aspirations. That's right. And, you know, even if you are getting, you know, the camera assistant's coffee in the morning, you're making their life easier, too. And, and that just, it helped, you know, it contributes to the overall project and, and the film, which through, is what you're there for. Yeah. If you're good at being a PA, then you can get that, you know, networking, like I said. And then later on, who knows? They might call you on and say, hey, would you like to be my whatever? Mm-hmm. experience with that and then like, it's, like i said all works up but yeah even being even those lowly jobs of being a pa you're helping those people you know keep going get their you know it's not just they're not just telling you to get coffee to see if you're obedient they're telling you to get a cup because they need it but also you know it, it will help them and their in getting the final product finished so everything you know a film study works in tandem mm-hmm. just down from that you know so but yeah, you have to start, you know, from the bottom most of the time and you can work your way up. Yeah. It might but not be fun. glorious. Yeah. But it's very necessary. Yeah. And hey, no professional uh, uh, set could function without all of those key grip, gaffer, uh, uh, um, you know, Slater, PAs, you know, they, they all contribute so much to the final product of yeah. and, and make the, the ease of, of, of workflow. You know, you know, hair and makeup art, you know, my artists, you know, they they make the character look what they're supposed to look like. And I mean, they've won 
they've gotten Oscars for that, but mm -hmm. not the first job you come to mind when you say, you know, say a film job, but it's a very important one. Yeah. So like you said, everything works. It might not be glorious work. You're not, you know, front and center with the actors or anything, but it's a, a it's a, it, you were one of the pieces of the cog in the machine and everything has to be running. And if one cog is not working, then the whole thing collapses. Right. So if the PA is not doing their job or if the gripper gaffer aren't setting up the camera properly or not getting the lights where they need to be, then the so the photographer can't do his job, which in turn the director can't get his vision, which and then the whole you know thing collapses. But yeah, so but for people who are going out of the industry like you, Nick, you know, you it's good to have those aspirations of oh, I want to be a director one day. But you can't think, oh, I, I'm going to go out and be a director and then boom, everything's going to, you know, fall in place and I'll be the next, you know, George Lucas or Francis Ford Coppola. No, you have to start somewhere. But just know that you're still playing a vital role in that overall project. And once you get that experience and that reputation, that network, you can move your way up and then you can be that director you always wanted to be and, you know, make a film the way you would like to make it. But, you know, everything comes with practice and experience for sure yeah and that's that's how you do it you know you get your like you said you get your foot in the door be exposed to that you know acting as a pa and sometimes you know maybe a pa for a couple of years but you know they are very important to the overall everything is in service to the story right everything has has a function has a reason and it is a team you know it takes a village to produce a television show, film, you know, all that stuff. So um, those are, are our uns unsung heroes of a production um, and kind of roles that, that we have found to be overlooked personally. Uh, hopefully we've shed a little bit of light and a little bit of love and appreciation on those roles. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Uh, any final thoughts on... Uh, uh no i you know there's i thought of another one the script supervisor oh of course oh my gosh yeah that plays a huge part in continuity without them you know people are going with their heads you know cut off thinking wait what well, wasn't this supposed to be in the scene and stuff so having right that, you know you get to you get to post and you're like wait we totally forgot about that scene that yeah. is so important you're supposed to be wearing a red shirt but you know, he's wearing a you know or you know, in the background, there's supposed to be this type of, you know, car and it's not. So, yeah, that's, yeah, you could, you know, we could go on for hours on this podcast telling, you know, I know. different types of roles. But I think the ones that we did, you know, are still prominent in their own sense. And like you said, need to have light shed it on them because, you know, without them, the the major roles couldn't get their job done. So, mm -hmm. but um yeah that's all for me yeah and if you're like me you simply want to find work um start start small you know um it's all important anyways so yeah, always a company looking for something yeah exactly they, film set always needs there's always a need so mm -hmm. um and if they know you need your foot in the door and experience they'll be more apt to give you some even if it's just a pa but you know there's always a need out there, no matter where a company, big or small, um, because you, like it said, it takes a village to create a television show or film, even a short film, if it's, you know, one of those more high budget ones. Um, you know, it takes some, a large amount of people. I mean, should even, you could talk about extras. I mean, exactly. Yeah. They're not always paid. I know there's professional extras who make a living off it. Right. Yeah but you know that's awesome but if you're trying to convey say a, a scene six here in the mall and there's no one in the mall just the main character i mean they're gonna be like why is it a ghost mall you know you got <laughs> the have apocalypse a, yeah you know so if that's not your intention to be an apocalypse then well you're already so yeah there's so many that we could go on about but yeah i would say if you're going out in the industry you know start small work your way up um and then get to your designated point you would like to be at and that'll, but they'll take, it'll have to, it takes time. You don't just come an instant, you know, star right away, but, and then 
even if you're going pursuing higher education like I am, you know, learn different types, work in different types on uh, roles on set. So you have a, that, you know, general knowledge of everything. And um, and because plus, you know, if you just a tunnel vision of one role, there might be a role that you are more apt at and love more than the one you're going for, but you won't know unless you try different things. Mm -hmm. So um, if you're, yeah, so if you're going to, you know, higher education, you're gonna be working with groups, try different types of roles. Don't just be, you know, I wanna be the director all the time, you know, do different ones and then see what you like. And then you have that frame of uh, reference when you're going out and saying, well, I would, I see myself as this, how do I, you know, work up to that? And then you can go from there. Yeah, exactly. Well said. Um, yeah, you know, you, you might, uh, who knows, you could start working as a gaffer with a goal to move to DP, but then you realize, you know, actually, I just like gaffing. So you stick to that as a career and people make living off of that. So, um, which is super cool because again, they were really needed <laughs> on a set. Um, but that has been the Nova Film Podcast uh, episode on uh, the unsung heroes of a production. Um, I'm your host, Nick Hemp Street, my co host, EJ Chicky. Uh, we'll see you guys next time. Thank you. Thank you.